switch gears and actually talk about some other projects. Um, so in the last one, what I tried to do is kind of just do a review of fabrication uh, and then move to you know fabrication of soft structures and then show that example, a couple of examples. Uh, in this one, I'm gonna stick to actually silicon and silicon-based structures that do have PDMS maybe in them or maybe not, but just talk about micro and nano electromechanical friction of molecules itself. And we have some other projects going on. So this is all work from our group. Um, and I'll try to review a couple of different projects that we have, and I'll try to, um, uh, you know, again, you can stop me anytime. So this you saw earlier, but again, the idea of micro, nano, and bio. So I'm going to talk about diagnostics and devices for sensing. Of, uh, this is, of course, a biosensing workshop, so I should talk about biosensors. So we have a range of actually uh, projects that we've been involved in in our group, but I'll, I'll try to review a few of this today with you. Um, on one on a, a men's uh, microstructures for cellular characterization for characterization of cells. Um, I'll talk about that first. It's a, it's a mechanical resonator structure made in silicon. And then I'll, uh, depending on time, I'll try to go through these two at least, which is uh, um, a, a device for counting of uh, white blood cells for the global health application and uh, devices for detection of microorganisms and bacteria for food safety applications. Okay. So why do you want to make biosensors on a chip? Well, or why do you want to miniaturize the biosensors? Well, there's lots of reasons, just very briefly. Uh, these, some of the reasons might be this. Uh, reducing the sensor element to the scale of the target species and hence providing a higher sensitivity. Right? That's the general idea of kind of why we kind of go micro and nano. So if the a single, if you're detecting a single molecule and your sensor can be the size of the molecule, then you can potentially detect it, right? Your sensitivity would be higher. Uh, if you're making a small sensor, maybe you might use uh, uh, lower reagent volumes and hence lower the cost. Um, your time to result might be smaller because of smaller volumes and effective higher concentrations. Uh, maybe you can make the system and the sensor portable, right, and smaller. Uh, you can do point of care diagnostics. This idea of uh, for diabetes monitoring, right? There's a strip you can buy from the pharmacy. You can put a drop of blood and measure the blood sugar. Well, that's the idea. Why can't we do more sensors like that? Uh, you could do multi-agent <coughs> capability. And then potential for you, of course, in vivo, but also, uh, I mean, in vitro, but possibly in vivo also. So there's many reasons to try to miniaturize and make the sensor smaller. So. Uh, let me just jump right into uh, one sensor platform that we've worked on for some years, which is a micro cantilever mass sensor. So the idea here is to make a, actually, let me just one second, I thought I had a slide. Oh, this for some reason didn't show because it's hiding. Yes. Okay, so if you look at uh, sensing methods using biochips, there's actually many methods, but maybe broadly speaking, characterize them into three different types. Uh, you can do mechanical detection, and then I'll show you examples of that. You could do electrical detection, and there's different categories of that. You could do electrometric, and barometric, or potentiometric. Or you could do optical detection, which is certainly the gold standard today. Today, everyone, you know, the, what you find commercially available uh, is electrical, or uh, is, is optical detection. You find some examples of electrical detection commercially. Uh, there are some cell-based assays that are based on impedance measurement of like, cells growing on electrodes, um, but very few. Um, and there's hardly none, I think, that are in actually cantilever-based biosensors. So um, what I'll show you is examples of these two. We are interested in, in our group uh, looking at electrical and mechanical, and essentially the, the reason we are interested in these is because they're, they could be label-free. There's a potential of them, of these techniques being label-free, where for optical, most always, you have to you have to attach some sort of a fluorescent label or some other label. Of course, things like SIRS and other things that like Logan talked about earlier are very powerful approaches and they also potentially could be label free. Regardless, I'll show you examples of uh, some electromechanical detection schemes. Okay? So let's talk about the mechanical sensor. So one type of sensor you can make is a <coughs> resonance sensor, um, where the idea is that um, that uh, you know structure everything around us has a natural resonant frequency, right? Everything is vibrating at some scale. Um, so if you can make a if you can make a cantilever, and if you have a rectangular cantilever, then this is the, the spring constant for a rectangular shaped cantilever beam. It's a function of the Young's uh, uh, modulus. It's a function of thickness, width, and uh, and the length. Uh, and then this is the stiffness, and this is the mass. 
And this, this equation assumes that the mass is a point mass at the end. So the point here is that as the mass changes, as the mass increases, the resonant frequency will decrease. So if I can make um, an unloaded structure, a very small structure where the starting mass is very, very small, then if I load it, put a mass on it, this delta m, then the change in mass now can be detected because the resonant frequency will change. Okay? And if I could measure the resonant frequency, this, the, the new one, F1, and subtract it this by this equation, I can extract the actual mass that was added. So you can, you, you can make very small mass sensors, miniature mass sensors. Uh, this is the kind of plots you can get. This is the data from a cantilever beam in silicon that's 10 microns long, 30 nanometers thick, and it was about three or four microns wide, um, or a few microns wide, and you see, um, you can actually get the thermal noise spectra. So this is the resonance, this is the amplitude as a function of frequency. And this is the thermal noise spectra, which means that you don't have to drive or vibrate the cantilever at all. You just measure the, the thermal noise. And the way you measure these things, by the way, to measure the vibration is you, for example, the technique I'll show is with the, with the optical method. Same as like in, a, in an AFM, atomic force microscope. You have a laser beam that comes and would reflect off, and you can uh, uh, measure the change of the angle and the position of the reflected beam uh, due to the bending of the cantilever. So the cantilever is bending uh, or moving, then the laser beam will uh, change the angle of where it's going. So you can measure it using, opt using optical methods. And what you measure here is, in this case, the thermal noise spectra, which essentially is without any excitation, just at room temperature, the, there's some thermal noise because of the interaction of the molecules around the cantilever hitting the structure. And uh, there is some vibration, noise vibration. If you take that noise vibration and take the Fourier transform of that, this is what you will get. You will get the resonant frequency. And of course, in this case, the Q is very poor. It's just a, maybe two or three, or even less than that, possibly one to two or three. But then, um, uh, when you drive it, if you actually do a piezoelectric drive, then you see this very high Q, but the peak is at the same frequency. Okay. So, uh, with this structure now, sorry, this is the end for some reason. This is the So, you can actually calculate now that what is my minimum detectable mass? What's the minimum mass I can detect? Uh, using some simple approximations. Um, and uh, essentially, it has to do, as you can imagine, it has to do with, with how sharp this peak is, so how high the Q is. The higher the Q, uh, then the smaller the shifts that I can detect, right? So the minimum detectable mass is a function of the amount of shift that I can pick up. And the sh I can pick up very small shifts uh, if the peak is very sharp. Um, so that, and using some noise arguments, you can actually calculate the minimum detectable mass as a function of cantilever dimension. So let's say the length. So if you, this is the length of the cantilever for a width of one micron and thickness of 10 nanometers. This is silicon. So if you had a Q of five, then this will be the minimum detectable mass. Essentially, you can detect mass in the range of femtograms. And if you can get a Q of 500, um, then you could detect uh, masses down to 10 to minus 17 grams. Okay. So the point is you can take very small masses, and just as a, as a point of reference, most viruses, they range in sizes, but the, their mass might be in the 10 to minus 17 to 10 to minus 15 range. A single virus particle might be in that range, depending on which virus you are talking about. And most bacteria might be in a you know, ten, few tens of femtograms range. And that's what people have measured, and we have measured that too, viruses. And uh, and also, uh, a, 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 a one single protein that's 100 kilo Dalton would be about 10 to the minus 19 grams, and one DNA base pair is about 10 to the minus 20 just as a point of reference. So there are groups that are working actively on trying to push this, push the resolution higher and higher, and measure smaller and smaller masses. And my group is a group, especially most most notably. So um, we have done some work in the past of using these sensors as biosensors. Um, so here is a small cantilever. This is a, an SCN image of a cantilever that's uh, essentially, you can think of these structures as a, as a diving board in a swimming pool. It's basically a, you know, a beam that's sticking out, that's suspended, and is fabricated using men's structures. 
I mean using uh, MEMS fabrication processes. Um, and this particular one, you can see the shift in the resonant frequency when a, when a single virus particle is added. This is a vaccinia virus. Um, and the measurement is done actually in air. So we, we introduce the viruses in fluid uh, and then dry it uh, and then measure do the measurement in air to get a higher Q. And in this case, it's a thermal noise measurement. So the Qs are about five. Uh, and you can see the green is the unloaded and the blue then is the loaded. With one virus, the resonant frequency shifts to the left. Uh, we have also, you can then attach antibodies to these structures by the methods I discussed earlier, uh, either by using some SAM, some covalent attachment uh, of a silane layer and then an antibody, or in this case, we actually use a BSA, biotinylated BSA, stabilin, and a biotinylated antibody, and attach the antibodies. And you can actually specifically capture the particles. So in this case, the specificity is coming from the antibodies. And then the shift in the resonant frequency would indicate that something is captured or not captured. So this becomes a labeled precessor. You don't have to put a second antibody or another label on it to detect it. The actual signal of binding that is coming from the resonance, the mechanical resonance. Yes. Yeah. How to label the pin the or the sub material on the feet? On the surface? On the surface of the candy run? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the way we attach it, uh, we have attached using different methods. Here, what I'm showing is a, we use a molecule called a BSA, biotinylated BSA, and then put streptavidin, and then we bring in a biotinylated antibody. So the first, the first molecule is just adsorbed, but then after that, it is these interactions between biotin and avidin, biotin and streptavidin. On the oh, on the candy yeah, 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 yeah. So in this case, yeah, that's a good question. In this case, um, uh, the, they're all uniformly coded. Each one has the same coding. They're not specifically functionalized. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. So that you can do very easily now because uh, in the way it's done in many of these candy if you keep them apart by 100 microns or larger, then you can simply spot. You can, yeah, you can spot them. And you can put them Okay, so this could be used. Now, uh, what we're interested actually is in trying to use this in fluid. And we wanted to actually take this along a different application direction, which is to try to characterize um, cells with, and grow cells on these structures and see if you can characterize cell mass and the physical properties of cells. So characterization of cell growth and division at single cell level. Um, and this is a project we have ongoing for some time and then lately that we have also started collaborating with Professor Aluru and Professor Jimmy Shah for some of the modeling of these structures. So the basic question that is still relatively unanswered, I would say, is that uh, what happens during cell division uh, in terms of the, um, the, the accumulation of the mass of the, of the cell? And what is the, the rate of change of that mass accumulation? So you have a daughter cell goes through this G1, and possibly a G0 phase here, but G1, then an S phase, then a G2. In this phase, the cell is growing. And here, then, the mitosis of the cell is actually dividing, and you get two daughter cells. So during this, this, uh, this cycle, um, you, you'd like to be able to do measurement of the cell mass. And what we are interested in is, is doing this on the same apparent cell. So do it on the cells that, that's attached to a surface and of the same cell. Uh, we want it to be non-intrusive as much as possible, and we want whole cell mass versus the dry cell mass. So we want the cell mass in fluid. And the question is, is a cell growth rate constant or, or is it increasing? You know, um, is, is the growth, uh, it, 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 does the mass change versus time linear or exponential? And if, so basically, does the cell grow faster as it gets heavier? Okay. And this question has not really been answered to date uh, on, a, on the same cell, on a single cell. Um, okay. I can talk about other groups. So we have done this in the past where we actually first we made this cantilever similar to what I showed earlier. And uh, so here um, we also use a phenomenon called dilithrophoresis, which I can describe later, to try to capture cells on this structure. So you see that cells that are within the capture volume, as they flow by, they get attached on these cantilevers and we apply these AC electric fields across these structures. So these are electrically addressable. Uh, this region and these cantilevers and that region and the cantilever. This is the top view of these cantilevers in a, in a microfluidic channel shown like this. And again, uh, 
so cells flowing from the left. And there's many cells up here that don't get captured, but the ones that are close to these structures, they actually get captured um, on, on, these, um, on these beams. And then uh, these beams are actually functionalized with proteins. We have, a, we have attached proteins on them already. And this is happening in a microfluidic channel. So then we can actually get the cells to attach. And then we flow the cell media and get the cells to grow. So what you see here is actually confocal images that have been reconstructed to do this little moving video or this from a different angle. And what you see, if you look hard, there's lots of these green cells. Um, but, uh, and actually many of them are not where we want them to be, but there are quite a few that are on the cantilever. So like right here, there's one on the cantilever, there's one on the cantilever. You can see the blue is on the cantilever, and the green are the cells. Okay. Um, and actually, if you try to take one of them, and again, from the images and do cross-section, you'll see the cantilever uh, here, and then this is a cell that's attached. This is the top view, this is the cross-section. So this is the cantilever right here, and the cell is attached there. So, um, and you can actually measure the resonance frequency before the cell is attached. You can characterize all of them, measure them in fluid, and then measure it afterwards. And you s extract the mass to be about two to three nanograms. It's the mass of a cell on, uh, on this thing. It's really a small mass sensor, essentially, in fluid. Okay. Now, this structure was interesting, but it had lots of issues, and we want to improve it. And one of the main issue is that, that it doesn't have uniform mass sensitivity. These structures, the equations we are using, assume that the mass is placed all the way at the end, which is the equation of the single harmonic oscillator. So if the mass is not at the edge and if it's at a different position, then you have to adjust for that. And essentially, the sensitivity is very much a function of where the mass is placed. If the mass ends up being sitting over here, then you see no response whatsoever. Right? So what you like it to be is all at the end, or the structure to be not sensitive to position. And the fact is, when I showed this earlier, this right here, this structure is very much distributed over the cantilever. So the mass we extracted is not corrected for the position. It's actually not the right mass, but it's close to it. But it's not the right value. So you'd like to be able to, so the structure you might want is something like this, actually, which has four attachment sites to a substrate and a central pedestal. And now this pedestal basically moves up and down, essentially only in the vertical direction, that's the primary that's the, uh, that's the main resonant frequency. The, re the main resonant mode would be in this direction. And then it should be less sensitive to where the cell is placed. And as a matter of fact, if you do some simulation using ANSYS and you take a mass and move it around, uh, from the center to the edge, um, you're going to see less than a 4% change in the extracted value because it is structured mainly moving up and down versus moving it, uh, you know, versus having curvature of this. Okay. So this structure is what would be really nice to make. And we made that, actually. So this is our then on a chip. You can make uh, lots of this little pedestals with these four anchors. Um, the region under, underneath these structures is actually released. So they are suspended, except at these four spring regions. Each okay. You can make, of course, lots of them on a chip. We have an array of like, there were 10 by 10 and 9 by 9. So uh, and then, um, a student of ours, postdoc, no, he actually took a bead, this is in drive, in air, he took a bead and moved the bead around with the, with the needle. Uh, somehow, just doing that for many hours, he was able to get this to work. It's the same bead, putting it in different positions, and actually experimentally, you see that the change was just about 45%. So then, what we want to do is grow cells on this. Now, what we don't have today is a way to place the cell exactly where we want. If anybody has any ideas on that, we'd love to. We're trying to develop some technologies to place one cell on each pedestal. That's what we would like. But right now, what we're doing is sort of random seeding, and we end up getting about 20 to 30 percent of the pedestals will have one cell each, and then we do the measurement of those cells. Okay. So this is a microfabrication process. I won't bore you with the details, but essentially, we can use the silicon MEMS processes that I talked about earlier to make these structures. And then we measure the resonant frequency, uh, again, just very briefly. We actually use a laser Doppler vibrometer, uh, because in this case, also, the structure is moving vertically. There's no angular movement, right? So you can't necessarily use an AFM laser-based detection system. So the laser Doppler vibrometer works really well for this, where you can measure the velocity of the structure, and you feed that velocity back to a lock and amplifier. And we also had, if you remember in the image here, we actually have this metal, this bright thing is actually a metal 
that uh, runs through each pedestal like this. So each uh, each line, each row, uh, has actually is connected this way, and you pass a current through this, and you put this in a magnetic field to do an electromagnetic actuation, and you can increase your Q that way. So we have that set up, and the feed, the locking amplifier sends a signal back to this, and that's fed back to this. So there's a loop, and um, and you can measure the data. So we are essentially measuring the shift in the in the phase in this case, um, and that's how we pick up the resonant frequency. The shift. So they, we did some designs where essentially uh, these angled springs um, took, like the angled, the region where the angle was took most of the torsion. So if you have them straight, you still won't have them as sensitive. I mean, they would be more insensitive to, to the position. So we have to make the angle. And we found by simulation that this sort of uh, uh, 60 degree angle from here was the optimum. Like if it was like this, it wasn't as good actually. It had more, it had more torsion. Yes, this is actually 60 by 60. We can easily make that small. Yeah. We made it, we made it 60 by 60, so we can watch like one cell go up to four cells, or something. That was the idea, like a cell of 10 to 20 microns, and maybe able to watch a couple of divisions. That was the goal. But we can absolutely make it small. Thank you, Richard. Sorry, uh, does this device will have a residual stress on it? Uh, so this is SOI silicon. Um, so we don't find too much residual stress. It's a very good question. Um, so this is a silicon on insulator wafer, which had two microns SOI with an oxide, we edge off the oxide. So silicon doesn't have much stress. But then when we put, we do put some PCD on top of it because we have to put a metal layer for this current flow, and we have to protect that because we are passing current and fluid. So the PCD adds a little bit of stress. But it's still, I mean, it's actually very small. I don't know the numbers, but it's not a problem for us. Because we use a low stress PCD. Okay, so um, then you can do some interesting things like, of course, setting up a micro pipette. Uh, we love videos, you know, as many videos we can get to sell those cool videos. So uh, you can set up a micro pipette system to drop little drops of fluid and functionalize each pedestal if you wanted to. Uh, of course, here the medium is air, air, and you're dropping a fluid, and you can see it evaporate very quickly. Uh, which in itself is interesting because we're also measuring the evaporation. We can measure the evaporation of the fluid as a function of time, the loss of mass. Uh, but essentially, uh, you can do things like that. That one, the candle was broken. There's nothing there. That's also broken. There's nothing there. I hope there's something more good once the video ended. Okay. So we can actually functionalize um, if, we, if, we, if we choose to. Uh, but we generally functionalize a whole chip, actually. And then we do random seeding of cells. So here, you see um, these are fibroblasts that um, uh, have attached. In this case, there's four of them. And here, there's one. And then you can also do a measurement of, uh, for different cases, you can try to do extract the volume. Uh, and that was done um, through imaging through confocal. And then look at the negative frequency shift. So as you increase the volume, the frequency shift increases, which means you're adding mass. So this is just a verification that as you add more cells, um, and the volume of whatever you're putting in is more, the negative frequency shift increases, which means the frequency is decreasing, which means you're adding mass. So it's just a control that, that says that the sensors are working. And you can see some nice images of cells and sending their processes on these on this uh, on the sensor. So that that you can see some issues right there with stress and other thing with the PCBD starting to buckle a little bit right there. But all, all, all in all, the the uh, electrodes are protected. So then what's interesting here is that it turns out, of course, as you can imagine, that the, um, the stiffness of the cell actually affects the measurement. Because in this case, you are vibrating the pedestal. The cell is sitting on it. Um, but the cell is not a solid, it's, it's not a very dense object. It's a viscoelastic material. So what happens if you vibrate this thing and you have cells, which is, you know, think of it as a gel or something. Uh, it is going to also vibrate, right? So what does that do? Well, so there's some inter something interesting. So what uh, Kidong did was uh, was working on this. He said, well, let's fix the cells. So Kidong and Larry worked on this. If you measure the mass, um, 
after fixation versus before fixation. And as you might know, if you fix a cell, you are essentially um, uh, cross-linking the various proteins in the cell. And essentially, the idea is that you are pretty much holding whatever is there in the cell as is once you fix it, right? It's still in fluid, but you have fixed the cell, so you're hopefully cross-linking everything and preserving all the mass. But once you fix it, uh, and if you compare that to before fixation, this is before fixation and after fixation. Um, so the slope, actually, I should put that equation here. I think it should be here. The slope actually is 1.4. So uh, the mass actually appears to be higher after fixation. Okay. So something is changing in the cell uh, when you fix it. It is getting uh, denser. Uh, it is getting stiffer, stiffer, and the measured mass actually increases. And it, turned, it is because uh, you have to look at the model of the cell and looking at a still very simple model. So in the past, uh, we were and other people were looking at the cell just this way. You have a cantilever, which is your spring constant, plus uh, this is like a spring dash plot system. And this is your cell. The cell was assumed as a point mass. right? But in reality, the cell itself has a stiffness, it has some damping, and it has a mass. And what we are really after is that mass, actually, the actual cell mass rather than the apparent mass. So this is the, the, the real model, even though it's still very approximate, very, very approximate, but this at least is a little bit better than assuming the cell is just a point mass. So uh, these are, let's see, I thought they would work. Yeah, so this, you can see final elements elation that uh, Professor uh, Alouris student did for us, where if you fix the cell stiffness to be a five kilopascal, which is a very soft cell, which might be like a brain cell, you actually see that uh, the cell itself is gonna expand change its shape. It is not staying rigid during that vibration. Whereas if you have the cell at 50 kilopascal, which is more like a bone cell, maybe, or something in that, you know, like a harder cell, you see that certainly the cell is not, the vibration, uh, 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 the cell is in phase with the pedestal. Here, in this one, the cell wasn't in phase. All the points of the cell were not in phase with the pedestal. Here, maybe most of the cell is in phase with so certainly the stiffness of the cell makes a difference in this measurement. Now that's a, it's good and bad. Um, it'd be nice if it wasn't a function of it, but it's good because we can extract the stiffness actually now. If we do some more measurements and modeling, we can actually extract the cell stiffness. So, um, and you can actually then do a, numeric, uh, do a numerical uh, model. Uh, this is actually analytical, it's from that simple equation, uh, from the simple model, looking at the, um, the stiffness, uh, sorry, the stiffness, and the viscosity as a function of measured mass um, versus the actual mass. And you can see it's very much, it is a function of the stiffness. At uh, low stiffnesses, you can measure a mass that's lower uh, than the actual value. And it's slightly higher, I mean, well, at these stiffnesses, it'll go up higher than 100%. Eventually, as I'll show you in the later plot, I think I have it. Actually, for very stiff structures, for very stiff cells, it'll come back to the actual value. So the point is that the, this technique will work as is for harder cells. So now we are working, we did this with softer cells and now we are actually working frantically and trying to do it with harder cells also uh, to complete that study, but uh, regardless. So if you take that system, you actually, if you take the equations um, uh, from, the, from this data and you make certain assumptions, um, you actually have like six unknown. There's cell mass, there's Young's modulus before and after fixation, and there's Young's modulus, uh, and there's a viscosity before and after fixation. So you use this data, and you make certain assumptions, then you can actually use this model to extract um, the, cell the cell parameters. You also need the geometries, which we obtain through confocal, and we make the assumption that the real cell mass stays the same before and after fixation. We don't know what it is, but it stays the same, and we want to extract that mass. So it turns out when you run that model, you can extract it. You can. This is the normalized. This is the uh, the Young's modulus. So the uh, Young's modulus that we extract of these were HT29 cells, which is uh, it's a colon cancer cell line, and we extract the uh, Young's modulus to be around four to five kilopascals in the unfixed state. Uh, and we can also extract some values of, um, of viscosity, and I can go through this in more detail. But what's interesting again, what cool is again, figures. Uh, so you can actually, this is a, um, you can actually monitor the, the cell mass as a function of time. You can measure that uh, as the cell is growing. 
units of a function of time. So this is just a color, this is a colorized image, uh, I mean a video, but this is a cell. And in this case, it didn't divide, but you can see, if you look, that it certainly the size is getting bigger from where it started. Um, and also, every 20 minutes or so, we can measure the, the mass by the shift in the resonant frequency, and this is over 24 hours. And we can do this actually even over longer, over like 60 hours. Uh, and here is the same same thing as above, but these are snapshots of the cells at different time points. This is the starting point, and this was the ending point. And you can clearly see that the the area has increased. The cell has gotten bigger just from the imaging, and that corresponds to this area increase. So this we have now corrected this data for that stiffness constant. You can correct that and adjust what we are measuring uh, by assuming the stiffness doesn't change over the growth. There's lots of assumptions, but assuming the cell's uh, stiffness doesn't change, um, but you take that into account, then the, you can convert the apparent mass to the actual mass, and that's what we are plotting here. Do you think the affects the cell? That's a good question, but it's really only like tens of angstroms. So the actual displacement is no more than 30 to 40 angstroms. So we think it's not an issue, but uh, yeah. And then the actually see the cell divide, you'll see um, right there the cell goes into two. So that thing on the left was actually the laser beam. That right there is the laser. But that right there the cell and here it divided into two. And here you see snapshot one uh, right around here. It looked like it was trying to divide a little bit before. You can actually see right here that it divided and then it tried to it actually merged back almost and then divided. So cells will do funny and interesting things. They aren't <coughs> sickness cells, lots of interesting things. But you can actually see that. It actually tried to divide and then fused back and then, div and then went divided again. Um, so we can do lots of measurements like that. This is actually a control. Um, this was turned out to be like a debris or a dead cell or something, which after some time here got moved or washed off, just like you So that worked out to be a nice control experiment because nothing happened here and then when it was off the substrate, the resonant frequency dropped back to where it should be. That was, that was, a, that was a good control experiment. Uh, this, you just see cells just growing and it fitted more like a linear curve in this case, but you can clearly see the cell getting bigger. Here the cell divided, uh, it grew, and then actually this peak downwards is where the cell divides. Uh, and then here, you see the cell, one cell, dividing right here, going into two, and then dividing and going into four. And if you look closely here, this is a cell. It's gonna go to two now. That peak is the two. And then another peak, it will go into two, two will go into four. So that's, uh, so you can get some interesting data measurements this way. And uh, we think there's lots of stuff to be done. Uh, so you can um, you can get lots of curves this way and they you know um, it's 
your guess as, as to define whether it's linear or exponential, but there is some, but they certainly increase. <laughs> the end point is bigger than the, than the starting point, so we can measure the mass increase early. Then the idea is we took a lot of statistics, we took a lot of these curves, the sample curves, we took a lot of them, and actually compared the average mass um, and their sigma, I mean, plotted that, compared that with an empty sensor, and you can certainly see that as the, um, and we plotted that versus the mass change rate, which is the nanogram per hour, so growth rate essentially, as a function of mass. And we certainly see, what we see is that the uh, cell growth rate increases, um, uh, in, in this case, linearly as a cell mass, which means that the growth rate is exponential. Time. So uh, this is basically the main finding that uh, you know, the, cell, the cell growth, the cell <coughs> growth rate increases with cell mass, and the cell gets larger, grows faster. Um, and then there's other control studies that we have done, and we now we want to really do additional cell lines. We really want to do cell with different stiffness to check our measurement uh, technique, and also we can vary the surface property in each molecules. So uh, this work is continuing. Uh, Any questions on this? Okay. How much time do I have? Oh, okay, so I'll start another project that we have and just see how far I go. And this is detection of bacteria and, and um, development of point of care biosensors. As a matter of fact, the first one, the first example I'll give you will be just right. I'll be finished in about 10 minutes, which is for global health. So uh, we mentioned earlier the miniaturization of biosensors and how we would like to be able to make chip based sensors um, that are microfluidic um, based biochips that might be disposable, one time use, highly sensitive. Uh, you want to be able to detect different entities and modalities with that. Such sensors could be at the bedside, doctor's office, or at home, um, um, and used for a wide range of applications. So, um, what we have been really working on this front is trying to uh, integrate um, a lot of these functions uh, that you would that you do in the microbiological essays. Uh, do it on the chip, uh, such as putting some MEMS filters or putting uh, direct apheresis on a chip concentrate the source cells, to put antibodies, to get selective capture, to maybe grow cells in the chip, and then uh, do a growth detection using electrical methods, and then lyse the cells, and then do a PCR. So um, the overarching theme, I guess, across all these modules is we want to do it in a, in a label-free manner, and maybe do it electrically as much as we can. So one project, then now taking this platform, and now we can apply it towards different applications, and also, these are different modules. You don't want to, you might not put all of them on the same chip and just use one or two of them for different applications. So um, a project that I'll talk about now is for global health. So this is a whole problem of HIV AIDS epidemic, which is really um, a huge problem, uh, especially in the sub-Saharan African countries, um, where uh, there's about 33 million people living with HIV today uh, worldwide, and there's at least 2 million annual death due to AIDS. Um, and again, this is concentrated in sub-Saharan African countries, where 7% of the total population is with, um, with HIV. Uh, there are antiretroviral drugs available, but uh, the key challenge is uh, who do you give the drug to? That's the first challenge. And um, today, according to some statistics, only one in eight are able to be tested. So the point is that you have to test first, or somehow you have to test. Uh, and this is still an unmet need. Um, where you'd like to somehow be able to do a test very rapidly, very quickly, and take the test to the patient rather than the patient to the lab. So you want to take the lab, put it on a chip, and take it to the patient rather than have the patient to come to the lab, which is a huge issue in these uh, in the in the country in these countries with uh, severe limitation of resources. So this is a collaboration with Professor Bill Rodriguez, who's a physician in Harvard Med School and Mamet Turner. Um, so if you just look at blood, what's in blood? Well, blood has 5% of blood is actually uh, plasma. And then um, per microliter, you have about 10 to the 5 platelets. You have about 10 to the 6 red blood cells. And about um, uh, 10 to the 4, 7 times 10 to 3 or so, white blood cells. Now, within the white blood cells, you have the C4 positive T lymphocytes. And this is the one you're after. So an eight, for an age patient, that's the cells that you want to detect. And for a healthy individual, this number is around 1,000 cells per microliter of blood. When somebody gets infected with HIV, AIDS, then this number drops. The CD4 positive T 
quite uh, key number size, this number drops, and that's what you want to know. You want to somehow test what that number is, and then give the the drugs and the therapy to the patient. So this is a um, the CD4 positive telomphocyte count um, uh, cells per uh, per microliter uh, as a function of time. So when there's a primary infection, uh, the this blue line is the cells, and actually the red line is the is the actual viruses. This is the actually is the viral HIV RNA copies, but that indicates to the viral load. So what you'd like to be able to do is actually do both. You want to do CD4 positive cell count and viral load. But that test doesn't exist yet, and um, we're working on that, and I'll show you what we have done towards the cell count first. So there's an urgent need for rapid, cheap, easy to use sensors for blood analysis. You want to detect the CD4 positive T lymphocytes from whole blood. A normal patient has, you know, a thousand is maybe the mean, but it might be from seven to eight hundred to fifteen hundred cells per microliter of blood. And when the count drops below two hundred cells per microliter, then the therapy is initiated. So that's the spec. So we have an approach that we've been working on um, where it's actually a very simple device where uh, it's a microfluidic device, it's a PDMS-based device on a glass slide with electrodes. And what we do is we actually attach the antibodies or you can purchase, you can find the antibodies for the CD4 positive cells. So you attach the antibodies in the microfluidic channel and then we flow um, whole blood uh, in this case and um, the uh, the dimensions and the geometry has been optimized to then, then capture the target cells. And that was work that was already done in Mehmetoner's lab. I actually spoke there a few years ago and they were already working on optimizing and just the capture part. And then they were actually doing the capture by optical methods. They were flowing the fluorescent dye and then counting it by putting the chip in a microscope. So what we did was we came up with an electrical based method of detection where um, the idea is relatively simple but it works which is once you capture the target cells then you exchange the medium around the cells you wash everything off and then you slowly and controllably you, you, you lyse the cells and when the cells are lysed then all of these things from inside the cell are you know, dumped out in the medium in the, in the environment and cells are like buckets of ions so there's like lots of ions and there are these other Know, small molecules and large molecules. So essentially, if you can if you can reduce the background electrical conductivity of the medium, then when the cells are lysed, then cells release all of this material that affect the electrical properties of the medium. And if you can detect that electrical properties of the medium, then uh, the change should be proportional to the number of cells that was captured. So that was the hypothesis. And it turns out that it, it actually uh, works. Um, so. You, you can actually develop a sort of a controllable process for lysing the cells by using different sucrose and dextrose concentration solutions. So this is a percent of intact cells after they are captured on the antibodies. Uh, this is uh, after some time once you want to lyse it. So um, if you use uh, uh, sucrose, let's say here, high sucrose and low dextrose, uh, the cells stay intact. But right here, as you can see, in a couple of minutes, you can get them all to lice if you use a lower sucrose and higher, uh, uh, actually, sorry, if you lower the sucrose further, you optimize this, and you can actually get most of the cells to lice. And it turns out that if you measure the impedance of the lysing, the electrical impedance of the lysing, it's very sensitive to the number of starting cells in the solution. So this is, uh, this is no fluid. This curve right here, the first one is just DI water and then 10 cells per microliter, 50, 200. So you can start to see a change around 10 to 50, which is what it expects. So the impedance change is a function of cell number. You have a dynamic range, and your spec was, uh, this is actually 100, the spec is a couple of hundred cells per microliter. So the, so the, so the SA head is as sensitive as an ELISA, but it doesn't need a label. It just lyses it and electrically monitor the lysis. That's the, that's the basic idea. So uh, this technique actually works, and we are right now moving this forward. Uh, we started a company on this called Dactari Diagnostics, which in uh, Swahili means the healer, the doctor, it comes from the same word, healer. And uh, uh, the devices look like this. This is, a, this is an image, but it's going to look something like this. There is a cartridge, um, which actually is a little bit more complicated than what I showed earlier, because it turns out we have to prepackage three solutions in the same cartridge. 
because you need to, um, the cartridge should be completely um, self-contained. And all you should be able to do is plug it in and put a drop of blood. So um, you want to prick the patient's finger with the lancet, apply a drop of blood to the disposable cartridge, pump the blood at a certain flow rate, then you pump saline buffer. So this, this is when the cells are being captured. So you do that for a little while, a couple of minutes, till the cells are captured. Um, then you pump saline buffer solutions. That needs to be incorporated within the cartridge and pouches. And then uh, you push this first an 8.5% sucrose buffer, and then the lower concentration sucrose buffer uh, to control the lice. Because if you, uh, if you flow out all the lice they do quickly before measuring it, then you lose all your data too. So um, you have to optimize that. And then you measure the impedance of that chamber um, once the cells are lysed. The count. So this is actually working out quite well, and we hope that we'll actually very soon um, start uh, some field testing and actually first four, we'll do it at four different hospitals in the US, and then we'll go over to uh, hopefully uh, one of the sub-Saharan African countries. So let's get the, I mean, that work is continuing. In parallel, on the research side, we are uh, continuing to make the technique more accurate, and we want to actually, again, keep it simple and cheap, as, as simple and cheap as we can, but yet uh, make it more accurate. So we have implemented a counter, an electrical counter. In this case, cells, um, uh, this just shows that we can have cells flow by in a microfluidic device. This is a silicon chip with electrodes with a PDMS channel, very similar to the one you're using. Um, has uh, a few ports here. This actually has a port here for 2D flow, and then one for the sample, and then one here for a 3D sheet flow, where we can try to push the cells down towards the electrodes to get a better signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, this is the impedance signal as a function of time. This is the noise. Uh, this is cells flowing by these electrodes. So you see each spike here is uh, an increase in impedance for the cell flowing by. Uh, this is a 2D sheet flow, and we do it with a 3D sheet flow, we get better um, signal to noise ratio, better uniformity of the pulses because the cells are now closer to the electrode the 3D sheet flow. And in this case, this is an electrical counter that um, we compared to um, a flow cytometer, and it works pretty well. So our counter can count the cells as, as good as a flow cytometer. So we're, we're continuing this work, and now we're actually trying to add specificity to this, so we can, this is just counting to see if we can actually get uh, cells to be uh, specifically captured and counted to the CD4 monitor Right? I think we can stop here. I'm going to